Working at Ophelia's wasn't all that bad. Behind the gimmick, it was more or less like any other restaurant I'd worked in. I'd heard a lot of people call it the Goth Hooters, although I don't really think that's the best comparison. They paid us well, and they treated us well, so there really wasn't much else I could realistically ask for. Honestly, if it wasn't for the VIP bar and their weird set of rules, I'd have said there was nothing even remotely special about Ophelia's. But there's the rub, right? The VIP bar and the rules surrounding it. On my first day working there, the owner himself sat me down to go over the rules, and they made it pretty clear that they took these rules very seriously. Yeah, they're uh, mostly there for both guidance and as a you know, precaution, he said. Corporate really pushes us to make sure they're in force, you know? So uh, try to keep them in mind when you're on shift. And I know uh, some of them might seem a little uh, <laughs> absurd, <laughs> but I promise you, you know, they're there for a reason. I told him that I understood and assured him I'd do everything I could to follow the rules. And I meant it, even if I wasn't entirely sure why they needed to exist in the first place. So what are the rules for working at Ophelia's? I'll tell you. Lord knows I have read them over so many times that I know them by heart. They were posted in the kitchen, behind the bar, and by the employee lockers, so it was hard to go anywhere without being reminded of them. Rule number one. If a guest presents a black card, it must be taken to the bar and scanned. If the card is approved by our system, lead them to the VIP bar, which can be accessed through an unmarked door in the back of the restaurant. Number two. If the card is not approved, notify the management immediately, but do not notify the guest and do not engage in conversation with the guest no new guest may be seated until the unapproved guest has been dealt with. Please see lockdown and evacuation procedures for instructions in the event of an escalation. Number three, please review the lockdown and evacuation procedures regularly. The safety of our staff and guests is our top priority. Be familiar with the emergency exits and safe zones. Number four, only employees with a violent lanyard ID badge are to be allowed access to the VIP bar. Number five, wait staff are not to follow the guest into the VIP bar, even if invited. If a guest invites a staff member into the VIP bar, they are to refuse and report the incident to management. Number six, neither the VIP bar nor the policies surrounding the VIP bar are to be discussed with outside parties. Violation of this rule will result in instant termination. Number seven, while on shift, you will be given a name to use. The name you are given must be used at all times while inside the restaurant. Do not tell the customers your real name under any circumstances. Number eight, for your safety, do not make direct eye contact with the guest, especially if they have presented you with a black card. Number nine, if any guest requests to meet up with you outside of work or asks for your real name, you are to say no. If the guest persists, call management. Number 10, if you suspect a guest has followed you outside of work, Inform the management ASAP. They will decide whether the police need to be contacted or if the problem should be dealt with by another avenue. Do not contact the police yourself. So like I said, the rules were weird. No eye contact, using fake names, being encouraged to report incidents to the management instead of calling the police. I'll seem a little suspicious, you know. Then there's the whole set of rules regarding the VIP bar. They weren't joking about taking them seriously either. I'd seen the waitress, Persephone, 
tear some girls a new one for flirting with customers or using their real names in the restaurant. I had even seen her fire people on the spot. This one girl was let go when she posted a picture of the rules online, and one of the bartenders who'd started around the same time I had lost his job after trying to sneak into the VIP bar. Now, Persephone wasn't necessarily someone I'd describe as strict. If anything, she was pretty easygoing most of the time. But when it came to the rules, there was no room for debate with either her or the management. Speaking of the VIP bar, I didn't really know what went on down there, and uh, neither did most of the employees. But we had our suspicions, mainly, that there was something illegal going on down there. Although speculation on exactly what ranged from a Breaking Bad-style drug lab to human trafficking. Tamer theories suggested that it just might be a shady meeting place for, you know, weird characters, or a harmless speakeasy that marketed itself by being exclusive. Either way, most of us had no idea what was down there. And the few of us who did, we never talked about it. Despite the secrecy, I personally figured that whatever was going on in the VIP bar wasn't anything too illegal. Every Ophelia's had one, and they couldn't all be drug labs, right? Plus, most of the handful of staff members that did have access to the VIP bar were bartenders. So, I mean, that at least implied that there was an actual bar down there. Either way, I never questioned any of it that much. The regular bar work paid pretty well, and the police had never shut up to investigate. So there was at least an implication that whatever was going on down there was fully above board. I was curious, don't get me wrong, about the VIP bar, but I didn't really think about it that much, and it rarely affected my day-to-day -day work. A few times a day, a customer would come in with a black card, and I'd scan it. When it came back approved, they always did, I'd show them to the door. They'd scan their card and go downstairs. Usually, they'd come back in like an hour or so. Although, if they were too drunk or too rowdy, the bouncer downstairs would turn them away. I'd never you know, actually seen the downstairs bouncer, but I was told we had one. Now, the black card customers never really stood out to me in any meaningful way. They just seemed like regular people going about their business. Sometimes they'd come in groups. Sometimes they'd come alone. Sometimes they'd eat before showing their card to go downstairs. And sometimes they'd eat after. There were some faces I learned to recognize as regular black card customers. And during the brief conversations I had with some of them as they got a drink at the bar, I mean, they not only seemed pretty nice, they seemed normal. They weren't shady. They never acted like they were hiding anything, or like what went down in the bar was some big secret. They seemed extremely normal. And I think that's a big part of why I didn't question what was going on down there. There truly didn't seem to be anything that off about it. The mystery didn't seem important, or even like much of a mystery. Yeah, it was weird. But the entire freaking restaurant was weird. They paid well. Nothing seemed shady. I didn't question it, and everything was fine. And then Hector showed up. Now, Hector Volvi looked to be in his mid-fifties. He had graying hair, tan, leathery skin, and a sort of weathered look to him, although his physique was damn near godlike. I could see his arms under his t-shirt, and it was pretty clear that he hadn't missed a lot of days at the gym. Now, he wasn't a regular. I'd never actually seen him in there before, which is part of why I didn't pay that much attention to him at first. When he came in, he sat at a booth in Kitty's section, and he snacked on some appetizers. Calamari, from the look of it. Kitty came in to check on him every so often. Although Hector mostly seemed content, to pick at his calamari, check his phone. 
At one point, I did notice him reach out to grab her arm, and I saw that she did pause to look at him, although didn't think much of it. If she'd had a problem with him, she would have told me. I mean, maybe I'm not the toughest guy in the world, but eh, not that small, and I've got a deeper voice at times, which makes it easy for me to come off as intimidating, even though I've never thrown a punch in my life. As a result, most of the girls usually came to me when they had a problem customer, and Kitty was no exception. Now, I wouldn't exactly call us friends, but we got along, and I always liked her. Kitty was in her mid-twenties with long black hair that she usually wore loose. She was a good-looking woman, and I'd had to step in a few times before when some drunk customer had confused customer service with a smile for flirting and gotten upset when she politely declined their advances. Since Kitty hadn't said anything to me about Hector touching her arm, I was willing to completely forget it until she came to me with a black card. This is from the gentleman at 17. She said. I nodded, and I took the card from her before taking it to the computer at the far side of the bar. The black card had a picture of the owner, as well as his name, Hector Volvi. Although any information aside from that, they didn't have. No address, no date of birth. There wasn't any logo denoting who the card belonged to. Just a red four-pointed star in the upper right-hand corner. Not a cross. This was clearly intended to be something else. Now all black cards look like this. So I mean, Hector's wasn't anything special. I swiped the card and I waited for the approved notification to pop up, as it always did. Instead, a new notification popped up. Declined. Please contact management. My brow furrowed, and I looked over toward Hector. He was staring at the bar, and I made a point not to make direct eye contact as I swiped the card a second time. Declined. Please contact management. I set the black card aside, and I reached into my pocket to text the boss. He wasn't on site at the moment, but I knew he could be in about 20 minutes. Kitty stood by the bar, waiting on me. Um, everything okay, Daniel? She asked. Um... It's declined, I replied, looking up at her. Declined? She repeated. No, 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 that can't be right. He said it's good. Well, system says otherwise, I said with a shrug. Her eyes settled on my phone, and for a moment, I thought I saw something in her expression. Relief, maybe? I was about to ask her if she was okay, when I noticed that Hector had gotten up and was coming towards us. Hey, everything all right here? He asked. Yeah, yeah, of course, I lied, putting on a fake smile for him. Yeah, the VIP bar, it's uh, just at full capacity right now. I'm checking with the host downstairs to see if we can fit you in. At capacity, huh? Hector asked. He glanced at Kitty, but didn't say anything. I'm sure you can make room for one more, can't you? Yeah, yeah, of course, sir. Yeah, we're just making sure we can. <laughs> if you'd like to have a seat, uh, I'll send you another drink on the house. Now, I figured that would be enough to get him to back off, but Hector didn't seem interested. Oh, come on. Can't take this long to get an answer from the host, can it? He asked. Ah, uh, sorry, sir. They're pretty busy down there. I said. From the corner of my eye, I noticed Kitty rounding the bar. That was odd. She didn't usually go back here with me. Really? 
I'd never seen them that busy. Hector said. He leaned up against the bar and he smiled at me. A smile that was unsettling. His teeth almost seemed like they were sharpened to a point. Although even that description didn't quite suit him. That smile, it looked like something you'd see on a deep sea fish. Oh, come on. Why don't you just send me down? I won't cause a fuzz. I promise. He said. I'm sorry, sir. My breath caught in my throat a little. I, I looked around, hoping that someone else on the wait staff would notice that something was wrong. But they were all busy. The supervisor on shift, Persephone, was on the other side of the restaurant, currently busy. And the management was out. I felt Kitty coming up beside me, and I looked over at her. Her expression was placid and calm, unsettlingly so. You're sorry? Hector repeated, his tone almost mocking. Come on, kiddo. At least look me in the eye when you talk to me. He leaned in closer, but I looked right past him, right up until I felt Kitty beside me. I looked over at her in the instant before she grabbed me, jerking my head to the side, trying to make me look directly at Hector. I was strong enough to fight her off, but not strong enough to fight off both of them. Kitty pushed me, and I stumbled for a moment. Hector reached over the bar to grab me, and for just a moment, my eyes met his. Relax. He spoke that word, and I felt calm, drunk almost. Look at me. Kitty helped me regain my balance, and I finally looked Hector in the eye. I knew I wasn't supposed to. I, I knew I shouldn't. I didn't want to. But I did it anyways. My body just moved, obeying his command and locking eyes with him. I could feel something in my mind, something moving, shifting pushing me aside. Why don't we all go down to the VIP bar? Hector said. Oh, and bring a corkscrew. We might need it. The answer I wanted to give was no. But those aren't the words that came out of my mouth. Yes, sir. Right this way, sir. I said and I handed him back his black card. As I left the bar, I paused, both to grab a corkscrew and a violet lanyard from under the counter. The bar manager had left it there, in case nobody else was available, to open the door in the VIP bar. I'd had to use it a few times before, although I'd never gone past the door. Hector and Kitty both followed me as I left the bar, and from the corner of my eye, I could see a fear in Kitty's eyes, and I realized that she was in the same state I was in, aware, thinking, but unable to do anything. I'd always thought that the rule about not looking customers in the eye, you know, was just part of the gimmick. It was dumb, but they paid me to follow it, so I followed it. Only now did I begin to understand why it existed. Although if this was why they'd implemented the rule, what was waiting for us downstairs? I approached the door to the VIP bar, and I scanned the card at the end of the lanyard before quietly opening the door. I looked over to Hector, holding the door open for him as an invitation. 
Oh, you're too kind, he said. Now let's go downstairs and see if we can't find ourselves a room. Downstairs, I thought. We weren't supposed to go downstairs. We sure as hell weren't supposed to follow a customer down there. But Kitty and I both obeyed silently, following Hector down into the darkened stairwell, into the basement of Ophelia's. I could feel my heart racing as panic set in. I don't think I'd ever been so scared in my life. Here I was, completely out of my own control and being led into pure darkness. Beside me, I could hear Kitty's shallow, trembling breaths. If I was in full control of myself, I would have reached out to offer her a hand. But I wasn't in control. We reached the bottom of the stairs and found ourselves in a small white lobby with a bar and some small tables with plush chairs. The bartender behind the bar at the time was busy with some other guests and didn't seem to notice us. Hector didn't even look at the bar. He just led us toward a long white hallway lined with black doors. At the end of the hall was another set of stairs, presumably leading to some other entrance, although I'd never heard anything about a second entrance to the VIP bar before. Beside the entrance to the hall, I noticed a large, dark statue of a spider with the torso of a woman. If I wasn't under Hector's spell, I might have actually admired it. It was taller than I was, and both grotesque and beautiful at the same time. It was incredibly well designed. It almost looked lifelike. The short, platinum blonde hair on her head, it looked real. And I could have sworn that her eight shiny black eyes were watching me as I passed. Hector stared at the statue and smiled calmly. He looked around before walking down the hallway, glancing at the doors we passed. Each one had a small window in it, allowing us to see inside. Looking through those windows as we passed, I recognized a few people who I'd seen going down into the VIP bar earlier. Most of them were regulars. Although, the things they were doing in there, each of them seemed to be sitting on a chaise with someone else, sometimes a man, sometimes a woman. In almost all cases, they were bleeding usually from the arm or the shoulder, and I could have sworn that our regulars were drinking their blood. I only caught a quick glimpse of what was going on. I mean, I didn't see enough to know for sure, but it was hard to mistake those brief glimpses I got as I passed by the rooms for anything else. What the hell was this place? Because this wasn't like any bar I'd ever seen before. Hector paused in front of an empty room and gestured for Kitty and I to go inside. She went in first, opening the door and staring at the black leather chaise before her. I could see panic in her eyes. She'd seen what I'd seen through the doors in the hall, and odds are she'd noticed Hector's nightmare teeth as well. I think she already knew what was coming. You in the corner, Hector said, but you. He turned Kitty around to look her in the eyes. He looked at her with this uncomfortable hunger, and I could see her trembling in fear. Hector grinned and gripped the Rob Zombie shirt she'd been wearing, tearing it open with disturbing ease. Kitty didn't make a sound, but I could see tears in her eyes. Get on it, Hector said, and Kitty turned to sit down on it. 
Hector approached her, pausing to sniff her hair as he sat down beside her. He tilted her head, admiring her unbroken skin for a moment. I could feel a rage bubbling up in me. I wanted to hurt this guy. Kitty was my friend, you know, my colleague. And seeing her so afraid, knowing that he was going to do something so horrible to her, it made my blood boil. But I could only just stand there, wishing I could help her, wishing I could pull him off of her. Now, I had no illusions I could win a fight against this guy, but maybe I could just stop him. If I could just keep him busy while she called for help. Oh, very fresh. Hector crooned. I am going to enjoy this. He opened his mouth, revealing his full set of teeth. I wanted to scream in the moment before he sank them into Kitty's shoulder. She whimpered in pain as blood trickled down from her wound and Hector drank greedy mouthful after greedy mouthful. He let out a contented hum before swallowing another mouthful of blood. And that was when the door flew open. I was almost relieved to see Persephone storm into the room, looking angrier than I'd ever seen her. That's enough. She snarled. And Hector looked up at her, a quiet fury in his eyes that didn't quite match her own. He pushed Kitty aside before standing up. His teeth were bared, and I noticed Persephone's lips curling back, revealing an almost identical set of jagged fangs. <sighs> Whatever happened to privacy? Hector asked. Your membership was revoked. You don't belong here. Persephone snapped. Oh, God, here we go. Isn't an old man entitled to a meal? Let me eat in peace. I'm not even taking your blood stock, and odds are, you know, the girl will live. That's not the point, and you know it, Persephone hissed. Oh, let me eat in peace, Hector said again, taking a step toward her. His eyes shifted over toward me. We wouldn't want to make a mess of this situation, would we? That bartender of yours looks awfully upset. Be a shame if he got hurt during this whole mess, wouldn't it? Even though he didn't say it, I could sense what he wanted to do. I tried to fight my own body as it bent to his will, but I couldn't. I lifted the corkscrew in my hand up to my throat, and I stared at Persephone with wide, terrified eyes as I felt the sharp point touch my skin. Talk about pulling a cork. Hector chuckled. Persephone looked over at me, her eyes locked with mine, and I could feel something in my mind shifting, as if she was trying to influence me, maybe the same way Hector did. Daniel, Put the corkscrew down. But my body didn't move. You know, you're a young kid. Hector began. When you get to my age, the control you can exert over people, it's damn near absolute. But it takes time and it takes patience. Last chance. Back off. Leave me to my meal. And they both get to go home tonight. Keep this between us. 
and I might even share with you next time. When's the last time you had a square meal, girly? I could see a quiet defeat in Persephone's eyes, and the gears in her head seemed to be turning. Fine, she finally said. You can dine here, but if you do, you abide by our rules. The staff is off limits. Those two are off limits. I can get you better blood. I can get you as much as you want, but I need an assurance. I need them both to go free. Hector seemed to think it over. Is that so? He asked. Room four. There's a blood donor in there. You can have her, Persephone said. But the waitress and the bartender are off limits. Hector huffed before looking over at Kitty. Ugh, go, he said, and she immediately ran to Persephone's side. Tears went down her cheeks as she pressed a hand to her wound. Persephone grabbed her, holding her tight as she glared over at Hector. Daniel next, she said. When we get to room four. Hector replied, Tell you what, wait outside the door for me. He looked over at me next. Keep that corkscrew where it is and go outside with them. I'll follow. Persephone quietly escorted Kitty through the door, and once they were through, my legs carried me out behind them. Hector watched us go, before speaking to me again. Hey, who's out there with you? He asked. N -n no one, I replied. It was just myself, Persephone, and Kitty in the otherwise empty hall. Where's the spider? I looked down the hallway. The spider statue that had been in the lobby was gone. I opened my mouth to answer that I didn't know, although before the words left my mouth, I saw it. Only now, it was on the ceiling right above the door. Hector saw the look on my face. He followed my eyes, and though he couldn't see what was waiting for him, he still knew it was there. Oh, you think you're clever, don't you? Daniel, kill yourself. My heart skipped a beat in my chest as I moved to drive the corkscrew into my throat. And then I felt something slamming into me. Kitty tackled me to the ground, grabbing me by the wrist to force the corkscrew away from my throat. Persephone grabbed me as well. In one fluid motion, I saw the spider on the roof move. They darted into the room, and I saw Hector stare up at them with a quiet acceptance in the moment before their talons tore into his flesh. One moment he was there, the next he was gone, snatched off the ground and wrapped in silk. He didn't even scream, but I could feel whatever influence he had fading from my mind as I regained control. Daniel, are you all right? Persephone asked as I hurled the corkscrew aside. My hands were shaking. There was a small cut on my neck, but otherwise I was fine. I nodded. She took a look at the cut on my neck before finally helping me up and going to attend to Kitty's wound. While she did that, I found myself staring up at the ceiling. 
Hector was fully encased in webbing now, and I watched as the spider on the ceiling secured their work. I wasn't sure if he was alive or dead, and honestly, I didn't really care. If he was still alive, well, odds are he wouldn't be for much longer. After Hector was gone, Kitty and I had a very, very long conversation with Persephone about exactly what the hell had just happened. A conversation that I admittedly still haven't fully processed. It feels a little dismissive to say, we talked it out and everything turned out just fine. But in a lot of ways, that is exactly what happened. Kitty and I were both paid a considerable bonus for our troubles, and she ended up quitting a couple weeks later. I don't blame her for that. We haven't stayed in touch, but I do think about her sometimes, and you know, I hope she's doing okay. As for me, well, I got my own violet lanyard. I already know what's down in the VIP bar, so might as well do some work down there too. I'm not complaining. The tips down there are really good. You know, of all the things that people suggested that the VIP bar might be, I never would have considered the possibility that it was a bar where vampires and other fae who drink blood could feed off of willing prey. Although in hindsight, that does explain a lot. Once you realize that the rules exist to protect the staff from any bad actors who might visit the restaurant looking for blood, they actually do make a lot more sense. Of course, only those in good standing with the organization that runs Ophelia's get to feed there. Hence the need for the black cards. Apparently, Hector had fallen out of the organization's good graces. You know, I can't for the life of me imagine why. I'm still not sure what he hoped to gain by showing up here and causing a scene like that. Maybe he was just desperate? Maybe he thought he could stick it to the powers that be. Maybe this was all just an elaborate suicide attempt. Who's to say? Either way, the management has taken steps to ensure that this kind of mess never happens again. There have been some new adjustments to the rules, let's say. Now, if we have a problem guest, instead of just messaging them, we also message Persephone, and we message Brenda downstairs. Brenda, yeah, that's the name of the giant nightmare spider woman in the basement. Turns out that she's the bouncer, and if a problem guest makes it down the stairs, she's been given more freedom to make an example out of them if need be. Now, on one hand, I think that the policy is a little draconian. But on the other hand, after what I've been through, I can't really argue with it. And in the end, it really isn't my world down there. It's theirs. I don't need to understand it. My job is just to keep the drinks coming. And that's exactly what I intend to do. Hey, remember to like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video. And merch is out. There's a link in the description. Thank you for listening to this story, and I hope you have a good night.